At the end of the day, I often say, we don't sell equipment, we sell investments. Mm -hmm. The investment mm -hmm. that we're going to provide to a customer uh, is going to be competing at the CFO office with some guy who wants to paint the ceilings white because <laughs> it's going to make it more efficient. Right. The Industrial Sage Executive Series, sharing the stories behind game-changing executives, their organizations, and insights into today's industry challenges. I have Mr. Corey Flemings here from JBT to join us on the first executive series under Industrial Sage. Corey, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Pleasure to be here. Thanks very much. Well, so for those who aren't uh, familiar with JBT, uh, who, who are you guys? What do you who guys do? Who is JBT? Yeah. That's a very good question, especially within the realm of material handling. Um, JBT is actually uh, named after a guy named John Bean. Uh, who was uh, an industrial fruit tree sprayer okay. <laughs> back in the 1880s. So we go way back. And, and uh, he partnered up with a guy in uh, 1921, I think, uh, who was an almond manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And they created this company called the Food Machinery Company, which many of us have now, if you say the name FMC, go, oh, I know FMC. <laughs> so FMC came through... Two world wars, uh, mm -hmm. we built landing craft in, in World War II. Uh, we built the M113 fighting vehicle in Vietnam. We did the Bradley fighting vehicle. We got wow. into oil and, and gas. In fact, the fruit tree sprayer became uh, sprayers for uh, de-icing fluid on mm -hmm. aircraft after we started flying jets after World War II. You'll still see JBT sprayers out there mm -hmm. when you're getting uh, sprayed to take off in the wintertime. You'll still see us doing that kind of work. Um, so then JBT got its name when the FMC gas guys and the technology guys broke off. And long story, but right around the turn of the millennium, uh, they, they took the food machinery companies, uh, the AGV division, and then our aviation assets uh, that does everything around uh, commercial airlines and uh, loaders and unloaders and de-icers and mm -hmm. so forth, generators. <clears throat> and they spun that part of the company off back to its original founder's name, John Bean. So we're known as JBT, uh, John Bean Technologies, and that's where we came from. That, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, so that's a lot of, you're touching a lot of different industries. What are kind of the main industries that you guys focus in? So my corporate JBT, we have uh, really two big divisions. Uh, the food division, which is divided, subdivided into protein and uh, liquid foods. So We've, we freeze uh, half of the world's frozen food. Uh, we, our machines do at least. Um, we just do a lot in canning and frozen foods and in juicing. I think we squeeze 50% of the world's orange juice globally. Uh, and then there's the aerotech division. So jet, Jetway, when you walk onto the airplane, that jet bridge, the Jetway mm. brand is, is actually a JBT brand. That's super cool. Um, yeah. And then if you look down, you see the, the loaders and things that... The, you look out the window of the airplane, a lot of that equipment is actually JBT. Mm -hmm. So we have Aerotech mm -hmm. uh, as another division of our company. And the AGV division is part of the food tech division. So uh, the food tech division is all kinds of industrial machines for food processing, commercial food processing. The AGV division then, uh, ironically, we don't do a lot in food. We do a lot more in manufacturing and in automotive and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that we're, we're part of the food tech outfit. But we're, we're, nonetheless, we do a lot in beverage. Uh, anytime um, in the automatic guided vehicle world, uh, anytime you're dealing with pallets of heavy loads of full pallet size units, mm. that's the kind of equipment that we have uh, to, to work with. So in the world out there right now, there are really two subsets of, of the automation world for automatic movement. You've got the AMR community you hear a lot about and the AGV community, and there's a, a large perception that the a AGV community is kind of getting old-fashioned and so forth. Um, AMRs are autonomous mobile robots that use a different type of navigation technology, but the vehicles, generally speaking, are small. They're, they're carrying 60-pound loads, mm -hmm. tote size. Uh, whereas AGVs are carrying full 2,200-pound pallets, uh, the vehicles themselves will weigh 12,000 pounds. Uh, so the obvious safety implication of you know, moving 10,000 pounds through a rack system, you don't want to uh, run into things or certainly not people because it will really leave a mark. 
Whereas yeah. smaller, so the smaller AMRs, they can hit somebody and stop, and it'll it'll body check you, but it's not going to leave a mark, so to speak. Um, but there's there's certain uh, blending of those two communities, mm -hmm. uh, and as the world moves forward, uh, there's a lot of change that's in store for us all as we move forward in the future. Yeah, it sounds like it. So it's a lot of uh, you know Star Wars stuff that we're seeing, right? <laughs> there, it, there really is a lot of that going on. There's, uh, the, there's a lot of 3D vision. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting out of the automotive industry, right? Mm -hmm. Several years ago, we were thinking about or, uh, autonomous cars that were using 3D vision. Uh, a lot of that 3D vision is being imported into our industry that we can put onto vehicles, whether they be small AMR vehicles or larger AGV vehicles. Uh, there's a lot of that new 3D vision going on. There's radar. There's all kinds of different sonar technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we find obstacles in 3D space to avoid them and figure out a path to get to the from point A to point B the quickest? It's uh, really interesting. The other thing that I see happening in the market right now is um, for many, many years we had forklift companies mm -hmm. out there in the market. Uh, they're also trying to figure out how much longer will I be able to continue to do manual forklifts? Yeah. So they're all jumping into the autonomous yeah. movement as well. Yeah. Uh, whether you're talking about the European companies or some of the American companies here. So our company, JBT, is also getting involved in working with the, the OEM fork truck mm -hmm. suppliers uh, in automating their equipment as well. So there's a lot of automation. It's, we're just starting to see the, the tip of the iceberg that's coming. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and you know, I think there's uh, several reasons for that. And it's a super exciting time in in the space. Um, you know, as you look at the sort of really that evolution of how we buy, and if you call it the Amazon effect or, or what have you, um, you know, really logistics and supply chain having just a, there's a huge critical need from from that from the the ability of where maybe you know five or ten years ago. You would traditionally send, you know, goods and, and, and your products to a distribution facility. Then would go to another large distribution facility to retail out, like a Walmart. But now we're having these areas where we're, we're going more direct, and it's creating it's creating this this uh, um, maybe it's a little bit more stress on the system, if you will. It's a lot so, more stress. On the yeah, system. yeah. And you called it the Amazon effect. Um, I'm thinking of uh, Jeff Bloomberg and in, in the first. Uh, movie where he's looking in the rearview mirror and the dinosaurs chasing him down. <laughs> yeah. Wants yeah. to go faster. And that's, yeah, exactly. that's really the way it is. There's so much pressure. The Amazon effect of it's got to be there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I mean, 10 years ago, you'd go through a warehouse that could deliver in two days or three days. Yeah. Anymore, it's got to be there within perhaps hours. Right. Yeah. Right? Or certainly tomorrow. Right. Uh, and it does create a lot more stress on the supply chain. Yeah, exactly. So it's not even just the finished goods out the door. It's the whole the whole supply chain supply chain infrastructure. I can't right. talk. Wow. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, that's a, I love that visual. That's a, I think we're going to steal that now. We're going to have yeah, Jeff Goldblum <laughs> with the you know that's awesome. <laughs> it was but Jurassic perfect. Park. That's Jurassic Park. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Must go faster. Yeah, exactly. So all right, how are you guys sort of you know addressing that? Obviously, you know AGVs and AMRs really have. Obviously, there's. There's a lot of efficiencies you can pick up. Um, you know, how are you guys? Like, what are some concrete like examples or solutions that you guys have been able to solve challenges for customers to be able to bring in that efficiency? Wow, uh, <laughs> that's a that's a pretty wide open question. Many people would, I guess, be surprised uh, to find out that many of the hospitals that they go to mm. actually have behind the walls their automatic guided vehicles running running behind the scenes. Really, I didn't for know example, that. Okay. Uh, Ohio State University, they have, uh, I think, 64 vehicles at the facility, and they it's it's really an intra-logistic system mm. of the hospital. Yeah, You've got food to deliver, you've got dirty laundry to mm. take out, you've got trash to take out, you've got surgical cabinets that need to move, supplies come in from the supply room that need to be distributed through the hospital. There's a logistics system that's mm. completely automated in that hospital that actually has elevators uh, that goes... From the basement all the way to the you know twenty third floor, uh, Greenville, South Carolina has a hospital that's completely automated, and that's all behind the scenes kind of thing. Right. So like the corridors. patients don't even know that they're there. Okay, interesting. Uh, what we're starting to look at now is is moving with AMR assistance to to move into patient rooms using these kinds of AMR vehicles mm -hmm. as well. So 
So there's the logistics system, and then there are more specialized or um, efficient ways to move material through a hospital if it's just a, a heart pump that needs to go from the, the equipment room to room 324. There's no sentence in sending a whole barge up there, for yeah. example. Right? Yeah. Uh, so those are some interesting applications we've seen. Um, they're all over the automotive market. Uh, it goes without saying. Uh, most recently, like drywall, right? You think about any factory that has uh, hmm. manufacturing you can't turn off, right? So you start right. building or generating gypsum to be able to <laughs> liquid gypsum to make gypsum board. You don't want to turn that machine off. Injection molding, plastic, glass manufacturing, uh, metal manufacturing, those kinds of industries where the machine just runs, whether you're ready for it to come out or not, it's coming out. <laughs> right. Uh, we've got vehicles we've built now for the gypsum industry that will handle 10,000-pound loads. Hmm. And those big stacks that you see at, at uh, Home Depot or Lowe's, uh, we're picking those things up and maneuvering them around in, in the manufacturing plant and can even load trucks with those things. So we're seeing some very interesting new applications we're coming out with. Yeah, so I got, I got an interesting question. As far as, like, adopting this new technology and sort of rolling it out, you know, what does that look like for an organization that says, they typically say, you know, we've got a, we, we want to roll this solution out in, so, in sort of a, in our warehouse. Um, you know, this is a very sort of, I know you could probably answer this 300 different ways, but what's the typical, you know, rollout type period for yeah, something? That's like a good that? question. It's a, it's a, in fact, I was just talking through this yesterday. <laughs> Uh, how long does it take to, from the time the light bulb goes on mm -hmm. to the time we can get a purchase order? Mm -hmm. Yesterday, we kind of went through an average process can be about seven months. Mm -hmm. Wow, seven months. Why does it take so long? Um, it starts with uh, a rough order of magnitude. One of our salespeople will come. They'll walk through the facility. What do you want to do? Da, 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 da. And the first question we're trying to answer collectively with the customer is, is there even a project here? Mm -hmm. Can we get a rough order of magnitude of how many vehicles we would need and how much it's going to cost uh, to, to justify through a return on investment, oh, right. there's a project here or there isn't a project. Yeah. If it's a seven-year return on an investment, you, you know, it's a nice meeting you, let's part <laughs> friends and, and yeah. move on. Um, the next step then would be to go to a budgetary process where we mm -hmm. say, okay, let's validate the, return, the rough order of magnitude budget by running it through some engineering, coming up with a concept, uh, a budget, a layout, um, answering most of the technical questions, and it's going to be you know, plus or minus 10 or 15 percent. It's going to cost this much. Does that still meet the return on investment requirements that we have? Uh, at the end of the day, I often say we don't sell equipment. We sell investments. Mm -hmm. The investment mm -hmm. that we're going to provide to a customer uh, is going to be competing at the CFO office with some guy who wants to paint the ceilings white because <laughs> it's going to make it more efficient. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, and the return on that is, you know, 24 months instead of 25 months or something. Mm -hmm. So uh, they'll paint the ceiling instead. Uh, so what we're trying to do is just constantly keep an eye on the economic picture as we're going through the process. The customer, meanwhile, if they're a publicly traded company, they've got to have three bids minimum, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So they're going to grind through the, the sausage manufacturing process <laughs> of getting other customers to, to bid and trying to compare three different solutions uh, and that process takes some time. And finally, you get to the point where they say, we think we want to go with you. Now we need a firm budget. And then we have to go back in and really nail the number and really get it down. And that whole process, site visits that the mm -hmm. customer might want to make, visiting our headquarters, that can take somewhere around seven months on an average basis. Can we do it faster? Certainly. Uh, but it, for planning purposes, mm -hmm. think about seven months is what it takes to from the Start to the time when you're ready to pull the trigger. And then it's going to take another six to nine months to get the system built and installed. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a year and a half process to, from the time the light bulb goes on to actually get it installed and running. Um, something to keep in mind while, while you as a, an executive are thinking through that process, um, sometimes we get frustrated on the supplier side because it just takes so long for customers to make the decision, <laughs> six or seven months can go by, and right. we look at that and say, you could be saving two and a half million dollars a month. Could have started that at this point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a $14, delay, $14 million delay yeah. cost. Yeah. 
So that's that's kind of a rough picture. No, it's, it's great. It's interesting, you know, I, especially as we see more of these solutions rolling, and, and as the industry, you know, the digital transformation, you know, the big, the, the, you know, the big powerful words, you know, as we are moving uh, into this space, just to get an idea of that. Now, um, one uh, other question I've got for you is, I know we've got Modex that's coming up, you know, uh, I think you guys are going to be there, we're going to be there, um, you know, what have you guys got coming down the pipe that uh, you're going to be, anything you can reveal and share with us? Well, you know, we're, we're starting uh, our second freezer facility. And uh, so what's rather new uh, in the marketplace is a vehicle that will actually work in minus 20 degree mm -hmm. centigrade mm -hmm. uh, temperatures. Think about how much it costs your labor, right? If you have to, those of you who have at least freezers know how much you have to pay for labor. <laughs> Uh, to go work in a freezer all day. Mm -hmm. um, so these vehicles live in the freezer and they work 24 hours a day, seven days a mm -hmm. week. Uh, they get charged by, by getting charged through the wall. Right, The chargers can be outside the freezer. Mm -hmm. They plug up on, on uh, something that comes through the wall and the vehicle stays in the freezer and keeps working. Um, revolutionary, really. It's, this has been something the, the freezer companies have been asking for a long time. And we're starting our second facility now in the freezer market. That's awesome. Yeah, because um, I've maybe been to one or two freezers there. And it's, I mean, you've got minutes. Like, you cannot be in there for super long exactly. before. Yeah. And I think I'm sure there's, I know there's some sort of like OSHA regulations and different things in there. So it's, you know, fairly regulated. So it sounds like a, an amazing solution to where, you know, that, that, you, know you guys can really increase that efficiency. I imagine the ROI on that has got to well, be... the cost efficiency, certainly, you know, right? Because yeah. if your people can't be in there as long, it takes that many more minutes for them to right. do the job, and it costs that much more. So it's a real, real sweet spot for AGVs to, to work. That's awesome. I, so, all right, I got another, another little question. I didn't ask you this beforehand, so we'll, we'll see. Um, you, you, you know, with technology, particularly with AGVs and AMRs, there's this whole, like, in robotics and AI and technology in general, there's this whole, uh, from a workforce standpoint, there's a whole question and debate about, are these taking people's jobs? Are they replacing? You know, what, what, I know you, you must come across that sure. in the sales process. How do you yes, address that? Yes, they are taking people's <laughs> jobs. Yeah. Yes, um, but then, you know, the age-old question is, well, where are the, bu the buggy whip manufacturers these days? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? There, there aren't any buggy whip manufacturers anymore. But the problem that we all have to deal with is if company A and company B are competing, let's just pick two off the top of my head, Maybelline and Revlon are in competition with one another. They mm -hmm. both produce the same thing. If one gets an, a, an advantage in terms of efficiency through the supply chain, uh, the other's going to take it on the chops. Right. I remember a very interesting time. It was a, 10 years ago. I heard a VP from, um, from one of the from uh, Procter & Gamble, actually. He stood up and he said, I came to my job and I, I asked this question, how long does it take from the time we buy, let's just take Pert Shampoo, mm -hmm. how long does it take from the time we buy the bottles and the paint and the raw materials and the pallets and the plastic and the stuff that we need to the time we get our money back from Walmart? So, so the cash-to-cash -cash mm -hmm. cycle. Um, ask the studio audience. And I thought, six weeks or something like that. Um, now, p and I hope this isn't still the case today. But <laughs> it was 43 weeks. Mm. Um, he hmm. said, and that's not really the point. The real point is, he said, uh, what percent of our attention do you think our corporate attention was fixed upon the process of the work in process, right? So making the stuff. 90% mm -hmm. of our attention was on the manufacturing process. We're automating the manufacturing yeah. and so forth, right? Um, and how long do you think that process took? 90 minutes, right? So in this 43-week period of time, the supply chain, I'll right. say, 90% of the company's <laughs> attention was focused on the 90 minutes that it took to actually mm -hmm. make the material. Um, that was just really revealed to me. The supply mm -hmm. chain is where, so you have two companies, manufacturing the same thing, right? Right. right. Uh, it, and they could be any two companies doing any two commodity products that you go to the Walmart and you see on the shelf. Company A, company B, the one who gets more efficient from 43 weeks down to 22 weeks, yeah. their cost can go down mm -hmm. 
or their profit's going to go up. One or the other. Right. right? They're going to yeah. put the other guy out of business. Right. So to your question, what do you do then? If your comp competition puts in AGVs and they reduce their labor mm -hmm. and they get more efficient, what's going to happen to you if you don't? So right. the whole idea of competitiveness is, is really what's at stake. Yeah. Um, if, we can, if we can figure out a way for people to take orders at McDonald's by using a kiosk instead of paying yeah. people to do that, yeah. it's happening. It's a yeah. reality. It's business getting more efficient. Um, there's really no other way to say that. Yeah. Now, yeah. The, the question then is, how do companies deal with, if we're going to reduce the headcount by putting a system in, what's the most humanitarian way to do that? Mm -hmm. Is it to just tell them, oh, by the way, Monday you don't have a job? <laughs> yeah. Or is it to let the natural attrition of a company as people retire take those assets away and not replace them? Sure. And that's what many companies do. Yeah, and retrain all kinds, all kinds of different solutions right. around there. I was just curious about that. You know, always get... Different answers, so I like asking. Yeah, I don't like want to. Question. I don't want to try to dodge the issue. No, it's <laughs> it's a real issue. I mean, it's a, it, it is. And it's a real thing. But and it's funny that you bring up the whole McDonald's thing because that, that's exactly what you know. I was thinking in my head is that you know, that was a couple of years ago with the whole minimum wage piece, and it was like, okay, well, you know, we've got we're kind of hitting that nexus of technology, and then we've, it's a it's a it's at the end of the day, it's a I mean, it's a it's a business, right? Um, you know, I mean, there's obviously you want to make sure that you're balanced. Of course, but you know, at the end of the day, it's like you, you mentioned the competition and, and, the, and, the, and the technology pieces there. I mean, it's it's driving innovation, and if and you know, if we don't have that, your competition is really going to drive that innovation, and really that that's what drives innovation and growth, and and, and how you know, uh, was it John John Bean Technologies went from a you know fruit sprayer to I mean de-icing planes. Right, I mean, that, I mean, that was a national conglomerate. Yeah, yeah that's exactly how they. That's that that that's um. It's, 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 I don't know. I love the innovation. I I, I love uh, you know. I, I I love what you guys are doing. It sounds super cool. With you know, I love the whole the, the new freezer products that you're uh, rolling out with. Sounds like that sounds like an amazing solution um, that I could see a lot of companies benefiting from. I mean, that's just kind of checking the boxes on a lot of things there. Yeah. So um, anything else? Any I parting look words? At, look at um, look at the way we ship freight today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? If you open up the back of any given over-the-road freight company's doors, it looks like McLaughlin's closet, right? Because you, they're trying to maximize the cube. Yeah, yeah. I'll just suggest that in 10 years or less, the way we do that will be completely different. Because if what if you could automate your cross dock? Mm. What if when you pulled into your depot, you didn't have men on forklifts? AGVs were just swapping loads from truck to truck, mm -hmm. and the trucks took off again. Um, that's another area that we, we see a lot of potential. Absolutely. And, and it, it goes on. I mean, the, the opportunities to do those kinds of things, given the smarter and smarter computers and faster processing power, uh, just gets more and more lucrative as we see in the future. Yeah, case in point, didn't Google a couple of weeks ago talk about how they like, cracked quantum computing or something? There was something to that effect that they had actually like solved an algorithm or something <laughs> with that. So. Yeah, well, we'll and that's see. part of the frustrating thing about being a human <laughs> being today, right? Is mm -hmm. if if you're in business, you're it's a full time job just trying to keep up. Yeah, yeah. with what's going on around us. There's right. so much change that's yep. so fast. Uh, it's very difficult to just keep up. Yeah, it is, but it's also exciting. That's right. Like, there's so many amazing things. So, um, so Corey, I really appreciate your your time coming by the Industrial Sage Studios and, and kind of chatting a little bit. Um, if anybody would like to learn a little bit more about your solutions, it sounds like you have some really cool stuff. Um, where's the best way to, uh, to learn more about those or get in contact with you? Uh, our website, jbtc.com, John B. and Technology Corporation.com. Excellent. Uh, and we have a whole section there on automatic guided vehicles. And give us a call. We'd love to take care of your needs. Excellent. Corey, thank you so much. I really appreciate My it. My pleasure. All right. All right, so that concludes our first executive series interview We're here with Industrial Sage. I love it. I hope you enjoyed it as well, learned a lot about it. We're going to be doing more of these as the year rolls out, where we are going to kind of take a deep dive uh, and, and, and sit down with some executives to learn about what they're doing, the innovations they're bringing to market, hear their stories, uh, and hopefully you can learn a little bit about what they're doing, maybe that's in your industry or not, uh, and, and really take some of these things uh, at, at heart and see how you might be able to apply it in your business um, I just loved hearing how JBT has a rich history from 1883 now to 2020 as we move into this new decade. 
um, all the amazing innovations from a, a, a chemical you know, fruit sprayer, uh, using it as you know, de-icing. We're talking about AG, AGVs and AMRs and all, robots and all kinds of crazy cool Star Wars stuff. Um, and it's amazing where we're going um, as the industry just continues to change. So um, that's all I got for you today. Thank you so much for watching or listening. If you're listening, if you are on uh, any of the podcasting stations, we'd love a review. Uh, hey, share some love with us on, an, on uh, our social media channels. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, you need to subscribe at industrialstage.com. That's all I've got for you today. Thanks so much for watching. I'll be back next week with another episode of Industrial Sage. Industrial Sage is an open platform where companies can showcase their expertise and solutions to a captive audience of industrial professionals. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please leave us a review. Want us to tell your story? Go to industrialsage.com. This week's episode was produced by Rika Wiersma, filming by Donovan Jones, editing by Rika Wiersma, music composed by Oliver Michael, and executive producers Danny Gonzalez and David Karen. This is the Industrial Sage Executive Series.